Hello and welcome to some extra video notes for the HTML content going through the Hardy-Weinberg e principle, uh, which is what the Hardy-Weinberg equation is built on. So the, the content that we're going to be going through um, connects to the IB curriculum because we are going to be talking about allele frequencies and explaining a little bit more detail what is the Harney Weibrick equation and what is it being built upon, what ideas, and also we'll be looking at hypotheses versus null hypotheses as well, and how those get applied in when looking at evolution of a population. But a, a good amount of the content isn't stuff that you might be directed, uh, tested on directly, but it is more supportive material that you might help you understand the content that we've been covering in the evolution unit. So uh, hopefully this will help you but if you're super confused by it, maybe that's that's not going to be a big impact on your overall exam results. So, but if you want some better understanding of it, you can always come ask for more clarity. So when we talk about the honey weinberg principle and looking at the equation and how it applies to evolution, we're literally looking at population genetics. And so just to remember or to remind you this idea of a population, it's a collection of members of the same species, therefore they are able to interbreed with each other and produce fertile offspring. And then within that population, uh, we always will have a certain amount of variation. Uh, and so because of random mutations and sexual selection and the process of making gametes uh, through meiosis, we get individuals that are slightly different and they might have a slight advantage or disadvantage over others depending on how their specific DNA sequence produces changes or, or small differences in their physiology. So when we talk about population genetics, we're looking at those overall uh, distribution of genes, uh, the different versions of the genes, the alleles, and those allele frequencies in these different populations of plants and animals. So if we think about evolution, you've already said this before, but you have to remember that populations are the ones that are going to evolve, not individuals. So when we're looking at um, the allele frequency of a population, that's where we start to indicate that the um, group could be evolving over time or beginning the process of evolution if we're just seeing the allele frequency starting to change. Um, if an individual comes into the population or one individual is created that really disrupts the allele frequency, that doesn't necessarily mean that the population is now evolved just because that and the allele frequency has changed. We have to see a continuous change in the allele frequency over time to really show that we've had an evolution of the, um, of the group. So when we think about individuals, uh, or sorry, when we think about the, the individuals in the population, when we take all of those genes and put them together, that's where we collect the, the call the gene pool. So it's that, that all the different versions and how many different copies of the alleles for specific genes present in a collective group. And so the allele frequency uh, and phenotypic frequency can be calculated from that essential gene pool. And so a phenotypic frequency is pretty easy. We're looking at the percent of that specific phenotype. So if we had a bunch of individuals in the population that had brown hair, we had a few individuals that had blonde hair, we'd be looking at the percent of people with brown hair versus the percent of people with blonde hair. And we're looking about their phenotypes. But when we think about, let's see here, we give you an example of uh, individuals that might be uh, in a population that might be white in color. So uh, two out of every uh, out of the 10, so that's 20% versus eight out of the 10, maybe being darker color would be 80%. The allele frequency though is the percentage of those specific alleles. And so if you remember, when we're talking about dominant and recessive traits, uh, recessive traits can only really be seen through homozygous recessive, right? So we know how many alleles are present in an individual expressing those traits. Uh, but if we're having someone express a dominant trait, there could be two different ways that that's formed. It could be through homozygous dominant, which there would be two dominant alleles, or heterozygous, which means there'd be one dominant and one recessive. And so we can't entirely be sure that, or uh, won't necessarily always be, that the allele frequency and the phenotypic fre frequency are exactly the same, because the dominant version of the phenotype is actually a combination of two different genotypes, which would be homozygous dominant and heterozygous. So for example, we had two different population or two different types of alleles. We have the dominant and the recessive. In our Heine Warburg equation, we use P to represent the dominant allele. And we say maybe out of 20 alleles in the population, there's actually only 12 dominant alleles present out of the 20, making that 60%. But if we're looking at Q, which would represent the recessive population, that might be only 8 out of 20, making it 40%. 
And so here, looking at the where these numbers are coming from, this, this mouse population here, here we see a combination of eight dark mice versus uh, two uh, light colored mice. But if we look that there are four individuals in the population that are heterozygotes, that's the whole reason why we get an allele frequency that would end up being different from our phenotypic frequency. So we need to make sure that we're always calculating P and Q and that we are looking at our heine warburg equation to really be sure where the population is starting off in terms of the allele frequency and then we can measure how it changes. So when we want to use allele frequencies in order to really figure out what's happening to a population, there's a set of equations coming from the honey weinberg principle, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and it's basically these two sets of equations. So P and Q representing our dominant and recessive allele. And in terms of frequencies, um, we're looking, really looking at percentages, but we normally write them in just decimal form. So we're looking at anywhere from 0 to 1, where 0 being 0% and 1 being 100%. And so because of that, because we're looking at frequencies, all of these equations, all of the values in the equations ultimately should equal to 1. And so we have P plus Q, or the number of uh, dominant alleles, the number of recessive alleles, collectively should be able, their percentages should equal to 100% of the alleles in that population. We also have PQ, or P squared plus 2PQ plus um, Q squared. And so the heterozygotes, um, the, which is 2PQ, uh, the homozygotes dominant, which is uh, PQ, P squared, sorry, and the homozygotes recessive, which is Q squared, can't say my P's and Q's right, um, collectively those frequencies of those specific genotypes then also would also equal to 100%. All right, so this is ultimately what we are imagining when we're thinking about tracking the uh, genotypes and allele frequencies present in our population. So here's an example of how this might be applied. So let's say that we have a frequency, or we want to know the frequency of heterozygotes and a dominant phenotype that occurs 19%. So we have a population, we can look at um, dominant versus recessive traits. So maybe we have brown hair versus blonde hair and brown hair being dominant over blonde hair, 19% of the people in the population have brown hair. What would be the amount of people that could possibly be heterozygotes given that everything um, in populations following regular dominant recessive um, characteristics that we're not using co-dominance or anything like that? Well, we have to look at how we can utilize these equations to calculate that for us. So if we think about the dominant phenotypes, that is collectively going to be both the heterozygous dominant, and, so the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous or the P uh, squared and the 2PQ together would equal 19% or 0.19. All right, so then from there, we can try to determine uh, what the Q squared would be. So since the Q squared have to represent the other percentage of you know what's um, present to make that one we take one minus 0.19 that means 81 percent or 0.81 uh, is going to be q squared and if we take the square root of that which is 0 0.9 that gives us q so now that we have q now we need to calculate p well since p plus um, p and q together can create one if we take one and we subtract 0 0.09 that gives us a zero um, sorry, 0 0.9, uh, that gives us 0.1 or 1% or 10%, sorry. So now we have the P and we have the Q. So then all we need to do is put them into our heterozygotes formula here, which is for heterozygotes, it's 2PQ. So 2 times 0 0.9 times 0 0.1, that gives us 0.18, which is 18%. So that means if we have a population where 19% are giving us a dominant trait, and that means 81% of the stuff that is left over, it must be all recessive. There must be a good number of heterozygotes in that population because we have dominance, but we also have a whole bunch of homozygous recessives that are mixing with those homozygous dominants. And so collectively, they're going to be making up about 18% of that uh, population expressing the dominant trait, which logistically makes sense, thinking that if you had a population, it's mostly recessive traits being shown, you would expect a lot of heterozygotes to be produced uh, in that population. So here we can go through another practice example. So something like this, we say a plant species that is able to grow in nickel contaminated soil, and that's determined by the dominant allele. And so there's a series of questions that could be linked to this. So we know that growing in nickel is dominant, right? 60% of the plant seeds that grow in that soil, what is the frequency of this resistant allele, right? Or, uh, uh, the dominant allele, basically. So 60% are able to do it, right? Oh, sorry, a series of questions. And then of the plants that grow, what percent are heterozygotes? Okay, so looking at the first part, 
So 60% are able to grow in it, so that means that it being dominant, right? So that means Q squared plus 2PQ, that would be 60%, all right? So if we wanted to determine what would the frequency of the resistant allele, we have take uh, the 0.6 to find Q squared. So 1 minus 0.6 giving us 0.4. Square root of that gives us Q, which is uh, 0.63, right? If we take 1 minus Q, that gives us P, right? And so that is 0 0.37. And so the frequency of just the dominant allele, not other genotypes, collective of them, P squared or 2PQ, just the allele P, right, which is our dominant allele, that was how what we're figuring out, and that's 0 0.37. For the next one, if we want to think about what percent uh, of the plants that grow, what percent are heterozygotes, we go back to where we started earlier. So Q, P squared plus 2PQ equals our 60%. And we already know that P is going to be 0 0.37. And we also calculated Q there of being um, a 0.63. So um, also oh, heterozygotes versus, oh, there's different ways you could do it. So you could just take the P and the Q and you could put them into 2PQ and calculate it. Here they're saying that if P equals 0.37, P squared would then be 0 0.14. And so what you could take is to find out um, 2PQ is that you could just point 0 0.6 and subtract 0.14 and that would give you 0 0.46. Or you could also do is now that you have P and now that you have Q from earlier in the question, you could just put that into 2PQ and that would give you their answer as well. So there's different ways you could go about calculating it. Now, when we're using the allele frequencies to determine whether or not a population is actually starting to evolve, what we have to be doing is looking for a change in the allele frequency enough and we have to do a statistical analysis. Now we're not going to actually go through the statistical analysis of looking at different allele frequencies. That's beyond the curriculum. But in going back to the idea of doing a statistical test, if we're going to be looking for differences between two populations, we will ultimately want to be using a comparison of that population to a null hypothesis or this idea of a control experiment. So remember, whenever we're doing an experiment, we are supposed to have a control. So here we've got water and different types of um, um, salts, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, and we want to see which one of those are going to be really good at growing the plant. But then we also just need to use plain water as a control group to prove that maybe it's not just the, the water by itself would actually be much better than if we mix different nutrients in with the water. So we always need to make sure we have a control group when we do an experiment. But how can we compare a group of flowers in the wild to a control group? We don't necessarily have the ability to um, or maybe the, we might have the ability, but it could be really long, uh, it could be very expensive and take a long time to like take a genetically controlled group and grow them under the exact same circumstances without the influences of, you know, variation or selective breeding or things like that that might happen in the population and show that they wouldn't evolve without those things being present. So in nature, there really isn't going to be a control group. So what we do is we use null hypotheses, right, or null models to predict an outcome if there are no factors that would affect genetic variation. And so essentially we have a theoretical idea of what would be that population circumstances in order for evolution to not occur. And so under the circumstances that evolution would not be occurring, there would be no change in the allele frequencies. Are the changes that we are seeing significant enough to say that that population has changed versus the null group uh, where evolution is not occurring. And so this really comes up from Hardy and Weinberg. This is the Hardy-Weinberg principle, the idea of what conditions would be necessary and all the conditions have to be met for genetic equilibrium to occur. And so genetic equilibrium is this idea that the population is not evolving and will not evolve as long as the, the certain conditions are continued to be met. All right, so what we're going to talk about in the next few slides are what are the, each of the features of the honey weinberg principle that are used in order to create this, this null group. So for our honey weinberg principle, all of the following things must be occurring at the population all at the same time over the period of time that we're talking about looking at that group in order to say that it is not evolving and it is, must be a genetic equilibrium. So there cannot be any mutations occurring. There can be no migration, so we can't have people coming into the group and we can't have people leaving the group that would affect the allele frequency. 
the group essentially should be infinite in size, right? Or be extremely large, but really infinite in size is this ideal um, version of it. Uh, all genotypes have to have an equal probability of surviving and reproduction. So that means there should not be versions of the alleles that are better or worse than any other. And there really can't be any sexual selection happening. And that means that all members have to be mating randomly. So because there is no sexual selection, there is no probability that one set of male uh, gets to reproduce more than another set of males or, or same thing for the females. Uh, and so if all these conditions are going to be met, then we can definitely say that the population will never evolve. It will be in genetic equilibrium regardless of what conditions that the population is put under, all right, whatever experimental conditions you want to think, because evolution can't be possible based on all of these principles really being met. And so this is the version of what our, our, our uh, idealistic controlled null model would be. All right, so obviously in nature, no population ever meets these, this scenario. And so when we think about a, a group evolving and why a group might be changing its allele frequencies over time, we look at these principles, these ideas, and which part of the principle is not being met. And ultimately, is that the reason why the group is evolving over time? So we're talking about this idea of genetic equilibrium. So I said it earlier, but with genetic equilibrium, where again, it's when the frequencies of the alleles for specific trait are the same in all of its generations. And so we give you an example here of just one generation and where genetic equilibrium could happen. And so genetic equilibrium can happen for a certain number of generations. It's not entirely impossible in nature for it to happen, but normally it does not happen for very long. But here, if you look at the generation of these flowers, we've got uh, in the first generation, four red and four, or, yeah, four pink. And if you look at the phenotypic frequency, it's 0 0.5, 0 0.5, half pink, half red, right? If we look at the allele frequency, the ones that are causing uh, the red coloring versus the ones that are calling, causing the pink coloring, right? The red coloring from, comes from two of the red alleles. The pink cover, coloring comes from a pink and a white allele being put together. And so it's 0.75 for the red and 0.75. 25 for the white, right? So 75 and 25 percent. They go through a reproductive phase and we look at their second generation and we map out all the second generation, we see a phenotypic change. We have four red, which hasn't shifted, sorry, five red. Uh, the pink has decreased from four to two and then a white has appeared. And so you might think, oh, the population is going through the process of evolving because we look at the phenotypes, the phenotypes being are different than um, the ones we had before. So maybe the starting this process of change. However, even though the phenotypic ratio is different, the allele frequency is still the same. If we actually look at the number of alleles for the dominant red and the other codominant for the white, uh, it's still 75% and 25%. We've just rearranged or remixed up the ones that already existed. And because of that, we get our different phenotypes but the allele frequencies are still the same. So even though phenotypically this generation looks different from each other, they are actually still at genetic equilibrium because we haven't shifted the number of alleles. So if we're going to change the allele frequency, we have to think of where allele frequency shifting is going to mostly be coming from. So first off, mutation is probably the easiest and most common way in which allele frequencies end up changing. Gene flow, which is genes coming in and out of a population. Genetic drift, which is this random removal of genes, a random removal of alleles, um, maybe not necessarily because of selection, but because of random death in the population. And then we have selection pressure, the process of natural selection or even artificial selection, if we want to look at it, a human-induced population or human-controlled population, uh, some type of selection pressure causing the uh, allele frequencies to change. All right, so that being natural or sexual or artificial selection. So if you're unsure about those different words, those things I just threw up there, uh, let's go through those little causes of evolution. So this is where we are, what we're expecting to happen in a population which would drive the evolution over change or the allele frequencies to change. Mutation, we've already talked about mutation before, but remember mutation is a change in the sequence of the DNA. Normally this can result in deleting, right? Mutations or that could be uh, harmful to the uh, species maybe decrease its chance of survival. Maybe mutation here, for example, where species loses uh, its fur, right? Having fur uh, is important for body warmth. Not having fur, having more difficulty regulating your body warmth might have an impact on your survival rate. 
right? Lethal mutations, this could cause the organism to die before it gets to reproduce or maybe even die during development. There could be neutral mutations, which are neither helpful nor harmful. It doesn't really um, do any positive or negatives, right? Or it could be advantageous, pretty rare, but every once in a while it can have a positive effect. So for example, here we're looking at different types of lions. The male lion at the bottom has a big, you know, crazy mane, lots of uh, extra um, uh, fur around its neck and shoulders in order to make that larger looking mane body. And then above that we have this male, which is a Serengeti male, which has a mutation which has it produce less fur and actually that is an advantage to it because the Serengeti area has a lot of dry brush and a lot of dry bush area and so if you've got all this extra fur it's actually going to be more difficult for you to move through these bushes quietly and hunt your prey but if you've got less fur uh, you're more likely to be able to sneak up on something because you're not going to be interacting with those twigs as much as possible and you're going to you know uh, not shake as many branches and things around you so the males in that area have evolved to have uh, less fur, which actually is, is an advantage to them. Okay, so mutations in somatic cells don't affect evolution. Do you know, remember why? Right, somatic meaning your body cells, right? So only the mutations in your gametes actually get passed on. So when we talk about mutations, of course, it has to be something that is inheritable. Next, we talk about gene, gene flow. Gene flow is this idea of immigration or emigration causing a new alleles to be added to the group or existing alleles to be removed. Um, possibly so members moving between two different populations. Again, as we talked about with um, evolution and speciation, if two groups that are isolated from each other can still have members move between one group and the other and they can still reproduce in some way, um, they're still going to have gene flow. They're still going to be able to exchange genetic information, so it's less likely that they will speciate into two different groups and two, sorry, two different species uh, over time. So, um, if this happens though, uh, the people that are coming in, the new in members to the population, they have to reproduce with the ones that are already there. If they come and visit and then they leave without helping, but without adding to the, the gene pool themselves, uh, then it doesn't have any effect. Think of it as, you know, tourists. If a bunch of people um, from Australia come to the UK as tourists, but they don't necessarily stay here and have kids here, they just come here for a couple weeks and then they go back to Australia, they didn't really affect the gene flow between the UK and Australia because they didn't contribute their genes to the group in the UK. All right. So if the new members are very, very similar to the old members, typically there's very, very little effect that this will have, right? The genes will be quite similar to each other. If they're very different, there can be a huge shift in the overall um, selective, uh, the overall traits of the population because of these new interesting genes from uh, a different group under different circumstances have been added to the population. So next we'll look at genetic drift. Genetic drift is random events that remove members from the population. So it's not the same thing as selection pressure, natural selection or artificial selection, which might decrease the survival rate because of the environment's conditions. These are completely random and it's just circumstances, not really the features of the individual that led to their death. They give the example here of a group of insects walking down the street. Some of them are green, some of them are brown. The person happens to step on a couple of the green members. He didn't do it on purpose, right? The green isn't a negative trait that caused the increased probability that they get stepped on. The person stepping on them doesn't even realize that they've done it. But that random death of those two individuals now leaves only one green individual in the population, which is going to have a traumatic effect on the allele frequency, right? So genes, again, not really affecting survival. Um, if it's a small population, normally this is, has a much greater effect here with the insects and in that picture there. Uh, having the number of um, green individuals in the population be cut down by two thirds by one random act has a huge effect on what's going to happen. Uh, if it's a very, very large population, let's say that the insects there, if there was you know 20,000 of them and three got stepped on, uh, that's not really going to be that big of a deal, right? Uh, three uh, extra green bugs are killed versus the 20,000 green bugs that were present at the time. Um, that's that's going to have a significantly less impact on the allele frequencies. And the interesting thing is because of these, these natural occurrences, for example, like 
um, I think extinction events, we can create something called a bottleneck. And so a population bottleneck basically says we have a, uh, a big population with lots of genetic diversity between all the members. And then because of some major factor, some um, catastrophic event, major shift in the environment, maybe a, a meteor or a volcano exploding, some type of natural disaster, um, and it ends up killing like 90% of the people in that population and only a select few end up surviving again at random not necessarily because of the traits that they have it's it's just a randomness of who gets to survive well though that group that survives becomes this new founder group which can make a new population however they have very limited diversity amongst them because they went from a huge group to a very very small group and so they only have that very small gene pool left over in order to produce uh, the next um, uh, group or produce them the future generation so it severely cuts down on the amount of variation and if this happens enough uh, it could limit the survivability of that population so from the, gen the, the population bottleneck we then get what we call our founders effect and this is the idea that that new population that comes out from the old population um, is very limited in what traits it might have because it's limited by just what the starting population's members had. So they also give you this example. Imagine we have a bunch of different colored uh, ladybugs, and for some reason, a group of red ones end up moving to an island where those ladybugs don't exist. That island is only going to be able to be built from, uh, the population on that island will only be able to be built from the genes from that beginning group, that founding group. And so they might have a lot less diversity than the original group present between them, and so they'll have a, a very sh a major shift in their allele frequency as well. Okay, next, natural selection. Uh, we've already talked a great deal about natural selection, but it's this idea that you have your traits increase your survivability, your fitness, and so you probably get to um, reproduce because you survive a little bit longer. And we've already talked about different ways that natural selection can occur. We can have directional selection moving towards one extreme. We can have stabilizing where we kind of move towards the medium or the most common. And we have disruptive, which kind of moves towards the two least commons or the two extremes, kind of disrupting the group, kind of dividing it into uh, two. Now, another one that would also have to be um, dealt with it would be um, a cause of uh, allele frequency change. It would have to be removed in that idealistic population is the idea of random mating. So random mating or the process of sexual selection has to be non-existent in our control group, right, our, our, our model. But in nature, sexual selection is very common. Males and females often select uh, who they're going to mate with by their physical traits, which are supposed to be a representation of their alleles, right? Better traits might mean better alleles, so better survivability of the offspring. So we have different types of sexual selection. So there's intersexual, and this is where males and females are basing the selected um, on useless traits. So for example, uh, our peacock over here, uh, being brightly colored in nature um, unless you live in a very, very brightly colored area that kind of helps you blend in, which peacocks actually don't really blend in that well in the jungle, um, is actually a negative. The only real reason why it's uh, useful for the peacock male to look like this is because it helps them attract a female. Um, there's no advantageous need for peacocks to be this way except for mating. And so this trait really is quite useless except for the factor of mating, right? So color patterns, mating songs, for example, uh, specific mating dances, those aren't necessarily going to help the animal in any other way besides going through sexual selection. We could also have intersexual selection, and this is where males and females use traits to compete for access to each other. So this would be examples of populations where the males fight each other in order to have access to a female. So the horns on uh, antlers for reindeer and uh, elk and things like that, um, they get used um, partially for defense if they're attacked by something, but also in the mating ritual. So they will fight each other, they'll stab at each other, they'll try to flip each other over using these uh, antlers, and ultimately if they win, if they get to be the, the most impressive male, they're more likely to get to reproduce with the females. They get to kind of select them. So um, tusks, horns, body size, these are all things that would be intersexual. Uh, the intersexual thing leads to what we call sexual dimorphism. 
And sexual dimorphism, it means basically uh, physical differences between males and females, typically differences in size or um, color patterns as well. If you think of a male lion versus a female lion, male lions are much larger than female lions. That's a sexual dimorphism. You can even look at human beings. Human beings aren't as sexually dimorphized as a lot of other mammals, but human males typically are larger than human females. Uh, that would be another example of sexual dimorphism. So anyway, in both cases, if a trait becomes too extreme, it's going to limit the survival rate of um, the individual and therefore selection pressure kind of limits it from getting that way. If you're too brightly colored, you're maybe too easy to find, you don't get well camouflaged, and so you end up dying before you get to reproduce. If your antlers are too big, it's hard for you to move around and escape predators, so you're more likely to die before you get to reproduce. Uh, maybe you don't also have very good balance, right? <laughs> You have, so you have to balance between uh, having that trait but not having such an extreme version of that trait that it inhibits your ability to survive. Okay, so then the last thing we're going to do is talk about some two interesting examples of where we think about why the environment would be leading to evolution of certain traits that we might not necessarily think are an advantage. So here we have frequency dependent selection. So the advantage of a trait can change depending on how often it appears, right? So we give you the example of this idea of the water boatman. Here we have different versions of what a water boatman can look like, right? So these insects have different shades of brown. The darkest are much easy, are the easiest to see because when we think about the, the aquatic environment, looking down from above, typically the darkest stand out a little bit because they're just too dark, right? So they have the least advantage in terms of hiding from predators. However, as the dark drop, the light become more common. And so now the common uh, are start getting focused on by predators, making the darker actually have an advantage. So because the dark uh, population, the numbers of in the, in the population, the dark coloring decreased, the predators in the environment got used to hunting a different group, which might be the lighter brown ones. And so as the lighter brown ones became more common, there was an adjustment in the behavior by the predator. And so actually being darker in color might actually become an advantage because now the predators are focusing on, you know, hunting the lighter brown ones because they seem to find them faster because there's more of them being different, even though at one point it was a disadvantage, might start to become an advantage just based on the frequency of those uh, other members in the population. And so the last unique example we want to talk about is where being a heterozygote can actually give you advantage. Normally, uh, recessive traits, you either express the recessive trait or you are a carrier, right? And in carriers, they normally just have the dominant trait. They don't really have anything about the recessive trait that affects them. However, there can be some mutations where heterozygotes actually have an advantage over homozygous recessive or homozygous dominant. So this would be example with sickle cell anemia. So if you have the two normal forms of the uh, allele, then you have normal blood, right? You don't have sickle cell blood, you have regular red blood cells. However, you are very susceptible to getting malaria if you're a part of the world where malaria exists. If you have the sickle cell versions of the alleles, then the sickle cell blood, you, you get sickle-shaped blood, which gives you sickle cell anemia, which is a huge disadvantage in terms of your health, but you can't get malaria, right? You're actually immune to malaria. If you're heterozygote, you actually have an advantage over either one of them depending on the situation. So a heterozygote has just enough normal blood that they don't necessarily have the full sickle cell anemia. They still have some negative physical health, but not as bad as sickle cell anemia. But because they have just enough sickle blood as well, they also are resistant to malaria. And so they could get sick, but they actually will normally recover. And then so they don't have to worry necessarily about getting the disease. And so if you are in an area where malaria is very common, for example, some areas around the Middle East, India, Africa, and um, also in Asia as well, uh, it's actually an advantage to have hetero to be heterozygote rather than be to, rather than be the other two, right? Because malaria is so common, it's your best combination is to have somewhat normal blood, so you're still fairly physically okay, but then be resistant to malaria rather than be sickle cell or be normal. Okay, so that's all the stuff we're going to be covering on these notes. And if you have any questions about anything, let me know.